もう始めてよろしいですかね。はい。So good morning, everyone.、Um, I'd like to warmly welcome all of you to this vital session where we delve into the concept of smart campuses and their potential to revolutionize the way our universities operate. Not just technologically, but also with the perspective of social, economic, and environmental responsibility. Universities play an integral role in shaping the minds of the next generation. And as we stand at the cusp of the digital revolution, it is imperative for, the, for these institutions to integrate smart and sustainable solutions into their infrastructure. Today's session will unveil the intricacies of creating campuses that are both state of the art and sustainable. So today, we are honored to have with us.、Um, Sorry for that.、Um, today, we are honored to have with us、uh, Mr. Corey Kriegman,、uh, task force member from the G20 Global Smart Alliance, and Mr. Masami Shiyama、uh, from the Microsoft Japan, and Dr. Hiroshi Ezaki from the University of Tokyo. And I'm Yuta Hirayama as a moderator, advisor to G20 Global Smart Alliance. Okay. Um, this is a session overview.、Um, so, we'll also shed light on the inspiring new public private partnership or PPP led by esteemed institutions and corporations. A notable highlight of this initiative is the collaboration between the University of Tokyo and Microsoft alongside other key players. This initiative is facilitated by the G20 Global Smart Alliance,、uh, which is I belong to, and aims to build a global campus network. The essence of this network is to harness the potential of IT, networking, data security, and governance practices to foster cutting edge research on sustainable design and emerging technologies. We also explore the pathway to achieving a net zero footprint. Footprint through pioneering digital infrastructures that leverage IT, IoT, generative AI, and more. The focus is not just on creating new green designs, but also on retrofitting、uh, existing structures to make them energy efficient, along, aligning with global standards and supporting the green economy. Okay,、um, this is a session overview. And I'm、uh, opening and introducing now. And after this, you know, I try to explain about what the G20 Global Smart Alliance is. And then I will move to the,、uh, another speaker. s Good. So um, maybe uh, you may not know the, what the G20 Global Smart Alliance is. And this activity was born in 2019. So at that time, Japan government was the G20 presidency. and We try to put、uh, the smart city, the word smart city, it be a kind of the topic in G20 discussions. In 2020s, also, Saudi Arabia government is also pushed to discuss about what the you know,、uh, importance of the smart city. 2019, 2020,、um, there are so many you know,、uh, smart city projects built in all over the world. On the other hand, you know, technology governance is the issue. For example, the privacy issue or vendor lock in issue, or、um, so fragmented business model is also very difficult. So,、um, we try to、uh, mandate our mandate is sorry for that.、Um, our mandate was to bring together global stakeholders to establish and advance a set of global norms for the ethical and responsible use of smart technologies in cities. So, that is what we wanted to do. After that,、um, actually from 2090 to 2020, to,、um, we developed、uh, five principles for responsible and ethical smart cities. And also,、uh, we developed some model policies.、Uh, model policy is like, you know, there are so many technology governance issues over there. However, we gather the,、uh, many experts from all over the world. And, like Ezak Sensei and Corey is one of the task force members, but we discussed what the issue in the city and what you know, policy should be uh, more uh, like prioritized to adapt to the cities. And we discussed a lot, and then we, we are developing some policies. For example, one of that is the accessibility policy. So,、um, like, you know, there are so many, you know, 
accessibility issues over there. So we try to push su such policy to the cities. And then we try to um, increase such kind of, the, you know, uh, reduce such kind of the gap in here. And also, like, um, privacy impact assessment policies also we developed. Um, this, this is very important policy for many cities. And in Japan, uh, this policy uh, it was introduced by the cabinet office, and then uh, now gradually uh, implementing to some cities. For example, the Tsukuba city, uh, one of the super city, uh, is uh, implementing this policy uh, to their cities. On the other hand, and, and also open data policy is also very important. But our you know, project was not only developing the policy, but how to implement this kind of the policy to the cities. And then we try to develop some, you know, um, city network here, and then uh, now you know globally we have more than 36 pioneer cities, and also we have some you know local cities, local kind of the uh, regional alliances. Uh, it's over there, and like Japan, we have more than 37, eight uh, cities in in Japanese community, and also now we are developing Latin America over ASEAN network over. So we, we are developing such kind of the regional alliances, and. You know, um, in 2021, um, the Global Smart City Alliance was received the Governance and Economy Award uh, in Smart City Expo World Congress. So, when uh, our project was kind of, you know, uh, popular these days, but I, I know many people doesn't know this. So, and today I'm very honored to to introduce our project. And lastly, uh, last March uh, we had a uh, joint event with. Uh, Japan government, and so this, these photos are the G7 official public-private event high-level roundtable for the G7 Sustainable Urban Development Minister's meeting. And in this event, uh, Dr. Ezaki Sensei and the Kori uh, had met in the session, and now we are uh, started to discuss about this today's you know to main topic, green building policies. So um, I'd love to uh, introduct you know, what the Global Smart Alliance was, you know, did. Okay, um, my story is too long, so um, I'd like to pass to the Corey. So, um, so Corey, uh, you okay? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can hear you. Please. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you very much. So, I'm I'm Corey Glickman. And I just want to spend a few minutes uh, talking a bit about the transformation uh, component. So the first part is talk about the overview of the transformation of the built environment um, for wellness across multiple sectors. And that would include the idea of residents, agriculture, administration, industry and commerce, education and research, infrastructure services, and transportation and communication. And these components make up the diverse community activities that we all experience in our urban environments. And what works very well that we know is putting in smart monitors and controls across all aspects of cities. We would focus on areas of transport, buildings, environment, life events, infrastructure and utilities. And when we do this, we enable communities to transform the urban landscape. Next slide, please. So there are four aspects that we synthesize or levers that we use in this idea of, transform of transforming the built environment. The first one is decarbonization. So radically reduce the emissions for a zero carbon built environment. The second is democratization. So provide equitable wellness uh, for resilience for the living environment. The third is digitalization, having a digital backbone that smartly connects our buildings, our distributed energy resources, our people and our businesses. And the fourth is demonstration. The ability to visualize our hypothesis and our tests that sets the direction for the next generation of city transformation experts. And these are absolutely vital for us to be able to show what progress can be made and what ideas can be put forward across here. And then lastly, what I'd like to talk about very quickly is the vision. So we create this vision for a zero carbon built environment 
by promoting this equitable wellness and resilience. And probably the most important lesson that I can share with you, having done this for several years now in several cities around the world, and what we've done with the G20 and with our partners here, is we know that decarbonization is actually a user-centric, multi-stakeholder approach that will fail when it's enforced by governments that are not supported by democrat democratized action. That means you can set those standards as a government level and policy level, but if everybody does not contribute and participate, it is going to fail. We see that happen. So the action item that we can most leave you with is that you need to demonstrate by leading. You need to have the whole community participate, particularly those that are experts and those that are in their learning institutions and those in the businesses. And when that happens, that democratization, teams with government, teams with public and private entities, is when you truly see transformation take place. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time, and I'd like to pass it on to the next speaker. Okay, thank you, Corey, uh, for those enlightening insights. Moving forward, it's crucial for us to view this transformation through the lens of one of the tech industry giants to discuss Microsoft's vision on achieving net zero with digital. I'd like to welcome Mr. Masami Shiyama. Over to you, Masami. Thank you. Uh, this is Masami from Microsoft Japan. So I'm going to introduce the Microsoft Sustainability Initiative and Smart Campus Matter uh, very quickly. So the reason why, why I'm here is that Microsoft is a task force member at the 20 uh, Global Smart City Alliance project, as uh, Yuta san said. And also, the, uh, another reason is that the Microsoft has just announced the uh, agreed and signed the strategic MOU with the University of Tokyo uh, on the green transformation last August. In this agreement, Microsoft is exploring a way to support the University of Tokyo's effort to achieve net zero uh, emission uh, through the use of our technology. So I will touch on those uh, details later on, on this session. So first, we, uh, let us introduce the, how Microsoft has been tackling the uh, sustainability agenda as a whole company. Here is a bit history on our journey and the future goals. Since back in uh, 2009, Microsoft established our first carbon uh, emission reduction goal. For more than a decade, we have steadily uh, built on our commitment to innovation and investment in technologies. Onward to uh, 2050, we will continue to reduce by removing the company direct or electricity use emission since we were founded in uh, 1975. Be commitment and big announcement. And this slide, uh, here is a simple, simplified view of our uh, future goals, carbon negative, water positive, uh, zero waste by uh, uh, 2030. And we are also building a planetary computer uh, to better monitor, model, and manage the world ecosystem and protect uh, more land than we use. Across the company, we are driving these ambitious goals internally and helping set best practice and new standards for business around the world with software-driven innovation. Already, we, uh, we see a new area of solution emerging driven by data. Through our work with customer and partners such as managing data uh, using advanced analytics, uh, machine learning and a bunch of model in the cloud. We are helping on the organization in many aspects. As you can see, uh, we are building a space topic, uh, supply chain topic, also curricular, uh, circular economy uh, topic, and also smart grid infrastructure solution topic. When it comes to data, as the Alliance, uh, G G20 Alliance uh, focused on technology governance, uh, discussion often arises around the ownership and control of data. At Microsoft, we have fundament, uh, fundamental principle. Your data belongs to you. Uh, we don't use your data uh, for our business. When you or your customer desire to open up your data, we commit to safeguarding your permissions and protecting uh, your data against potential threats. Today's main is building and space, so uh, let's see our uh, own example first. 
So uh, when it comes to sustainability campus at Microsoft, we run like a medium size of city uh, that is scattered across the globe. The vision is to build, uh, deliver, and operate uh, connected, accessible, sustainable, and secure workspace uh, that creates the best employer experience. So uh, this is uh, customer number one uh, for us, uh, for smart building solution. Uh, our initial effort to reduce power consumption in our building was focused on the headquarter, Microsoft uh, Redmond campus, uh, which spanned 125 buildings, serving more than uh, 60,000 people. Across the campus, there were multiple building system uh, 60 million annual utility spend. Microsoft used Ironic, uh, who is a partner uh, solution running on Azure, and extended with Power BI, Azure IoT, and Dynamics 365 to remotely monitor and manage the building across, uh, across the campus. As a result of initial effort, uh, Microsoft achieved a, a 6 to 10 percent reduction in annual energy usage with uh, implementation payback in less than 18, uh, 18 months. So when we think about the smart campus, employer experience or student experience uh, is uh, very key, meaning the, such as productivity, hybrid, uh, wellness, or access. In order to re improve the employer or student experience with the campus, we need to uh, platform and operations uh, that help optimize uh, how we build and run our real estate. We have two operational platform, Data and BI, and also Azure Digital Twin, and six uh, operational functions on the uh, right side. So today's agenda uh, is the uh, Smart Campus, so uh, my slide will touch on the Data and AI and Azure Digital Twin today. So first one, data and BI. So we run one of the world largest corporate real estate data store, which we rely on to optimize the uh, operations and save money. There are over 20 uh, resources, uh, sources of data inputted. However, the real value uh, comes from the ability to combine the data source for insight. For a sustainability example, we have utility cost data for electricity, natural gas, fuel, including transport, transport fuels, uh, waste, including recycled, and water. The next level up is to apply machine learning to it, like uh, two use case. Uh, number one is space optimization, uh, batch data plus uh, Wi-Fi MAC address. Number two is energy efficiency, a more uh, smart start. So another one is Azure Digital Twin, uh, other fun foundational platform. So it's uh, to create the digital replicas uh, of our physical world. The Digital Twin is a normal world. Uh, normal world. Our physical world uh, means things, place, uh, people, and state. Uh, the slide shows example of each. So like data, having the digital uh, representation of physical world is uh, only valuable when we use it. For example, sensor system that detect environmental conditions such as temperature and air quality. We have a lot of smart uh, campus best practice and cases, uh, along case studies around the world, uh, but uh, uh, we're gonna introduce uh, the campus uh, universities uh, case study. So this one is uh, about Temple University uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, Temple University facility and operations need to create a smart building strategy uh, to optimize operation across its uh, 214 buildings reduce, uh, to reduce cost and enhance service for its school, business, employers, and student. So Microsoft partner eMagic uh, utilized Microsoft Azure Digital Twin solution uh, in five buildings on Temple's uh, Philadelphia campus as the initial phase of the integrated facility management solution. This solution enables the university to cut cost, uh, optimize energy and resources, and improving service level on the campus. 
So as I mentioned uh, at, uh, in, uh, at the beginning, uh, based on those uh, technology component and case studies, as I said, uh, we are exploring way to support the University of Tokyo's effort as a first step uh, to achieve net zero emission through our uh, technologies. Of course, the University of Tokyo uh, ha have been the various activities uh, about green transformation so far, such as the sustainable uh, campus project uh, starting the 2008, and also participation in the Net Zero uh, Race Race to Zero campaign, and also publication of the U Tokyo uh, Climate Action last year, starting last year. The goal of our first campus GS GX project is to help them improve energy efficiency from a sustainability perspective. This has both uh, environmental impact and its technology architecture could apply to other uh, smart campus scenarios outside of the University of Tokyo, uh, not to, in Japan, not uh, to all over the world. So as we mentioned, the G20 Smart City Alliance focus on the uh, technology governance. Microsoft stick to a basic rule, as I said, your data is uh, yours. Uh, as I stated in the bottom right corner of the slide, uh, open data environment. This one, yeah. And we started the Campus GX project as a pilot which aimed to reduce uh, energy through smart campus technology and have been discussing the architecture and how to uh, adapt the technology. With that, we will expand the current smart campus pilot project, which aims to reduce energy consumption with Microsoft technology, collaborating with GUTP, uh, Green University of Tokyo project, which uh, Isaac Sensei is uh, leading uh, to create smart building reference architecture, which would influence other smart building policy and the entire industry. So this is the uh, last, last side of my session. I'll end by mentioning the, some uh, lesson learning uh, that Microsoft uh, about the smart campus. Number one, starting with data. Begin uh, by collecting and analyzing data from sensor and system to identify the uh, campus issue and opportunities. The data insight from the found, uh, forms a foundation for effective uh, strategy. Number two, uh, optimize process. Before introducing the new technology, optimize the existing process uh, for effective strategy. So number three is define IoT uh, use case. So uh, let's sp specify a clear use case for IoT device, such as monitoring uh, energy consumption or improving security. Number four, uh, importance of the uh, floor plan. So it is uh, crucial, critical uh, for smart campus implementation. Uh, so let's uh, act have an accurate floor plan, so that's a key. Uh, number five, lastly, the cons construction schedule. So properly uh, manage construction schedule for uh, new infrastructure and technology, uh, meeting the budget and de deadline requirement. So uh, thank you for uh, listening and hand over to the uh, Dr. Aesaki san Yeah, thank you, thank you, Ishiyama san So um, yeah, could you start to? Okay, uh, thank you for introduction. I want to share with you a concrete number or concrete action based on the vision the uh, Microsoft or Hirayama san or WEF are having. So the important thing is we should show what we can do using digital technology or using the internet. First one is the uh, many of you may know, may not know about EP100. That's the electrical, I'm sorry, energy productivity 100%, which means using the digital te technology, you want to improve the efficiency, especially energy efficiency by double. Meaning the same work can be done by a half of energy. That is relatively quite easy in the case of digital. For example, when we use Google or Microsoft regarding the uh, application. When we have the cloud computing, more than 80% of energy saving be able to do. That is not a full number. That's a very, very, we, we can do. This is the uh, you know, 
footprint of the in 2022, how many carbon footprint each country has. The important thing is the uh, this is the uh, how many or high percentage of how how many uh, ratio of the renewable energy introduction in each countries. Some of the country already 90 percent or 80 percent. Most of the developed country probably 30 or 20 percent. Means it's large num large percentage of renewable energy we have to introduce that you may consider. Though when you think about EP100, the number you have to in introduce into your world about renewable energy going to half. That's the real number. So this is, a, for example, about Germany or UK or Spain or I Ireland. When you have every single industry, every single factory or uh, campus went to uh, EP100, we can reduce uh, the power energy consumption into 50%. Then, only 25% of the uh, increase in the uh, renewable energy. That's in the case of Germany or UK or Spain. Right? You can think about this as a, as a practical number you can do. This is India, USA, and Japan. We need just a plus 150% <coughs> renewable energy increase. That would be possible to do, right? Not the five times, not the 10, 10 times larger renewable energy. So that is the power of digital or the internet, you can realize. And also, I, I want to put, uh, put in front of you uh, three techniques for decarbonization. First one is going to uh, already built system that's as is system solution. Important thing is the energy, you know, uh, grabs by the digital twin for the system operation. That means there are many opportunity to apply data centric operation or artificial intelligence that this IGF team that's going to be applied to quite easily when we have accurate data. Second one is to, to be for the future, you know, uh, infrastructure design. That is quite important for developing country or emerging countries, even for developed countries. So uh, in, in the case of design, we must reduce the number of physical resources using digital technology. And also we design the system by design, the construction and operation, how you, we use the digital technologies. So this is one of the example when you think about of IT or by IT as is and to be. The left left hand top, that's going to be that's going to be you know uh, uh, explained by the Microsoft. That is digital twin. That is grasping whole of the system behavior or how the system are going to do. Important thing is the computer itself be able to analyze and visualize the system operation when you have the digital twin. This is one example, uh, you know, 12 years ago, I hacked, I'm sorry, I you know, you know, digitized digital twin, my university against the earthquake, shocking in Japan. My campus spending 66 megawatt. My building consumes one megawatt. When we have digital twin, we can reduce 31% or 22% energy saving. Not, I, want, I don't want to say energy saving. That is energy productivity improvement. It's going to be 30% or 20, 20%. It was 12 years ago. Right? Technology is going to be improved a lot. So more <coughs> complicated, more, more good, this, you know, there's a trim going to be done. And also, at that time, we are academia. Microsoft is industry. The important function of the academia is want to have interoperability. So we hate lock on by Microsoft, nor Google. No, Matt, your net, right? That is 
important thing is a multi stakeholder discussion should have those kind of global standard for interoperability. So next one is the uh, ASIS of, of, of IT. That is yet another interesting thing you, you, you can do. This is the actual example, practical, practical resolution. Also, this is more than 10 years ago. BMW in Germany has their own IT asset facilities. They analyze all of the fat, all the tasks in their company. Then they realize only 20% of the uh, task requires small latency and very critical data. It must be in nearby their facilities or, you know, though 80% of the task, allowing large latency and not the critical data like R&D simulation or the others means 80% of the task be able to migrate to 100% renewable energy country, which is Iceland and Sweden, right? Since the internet or computer system can be globally distributed, then you can select the location or soil, wherever you want. That is 20, 12 years ago lesson learned we did. Tech technology be able to apply those kind, kind of thing, right? So this is the uh, lesson learned from this. 100% renewable energy gonna be done in somewhere on the earth. Then the, uh, and also some of the on the premise computers be able to go into the data center, then at least 30 or 40 percent energy cut be able to due to the very high performance edge bags. When you use the cloud, as I mentioned, 70 or 80 percent be able to cut by sharing economy. Sharing economy is also good not only for the power saving but also the resource reduction, the physical resource, like a computers or HVACs or the other, or building itself, large deduction of the, of the system be able to do. So the other one, the, especially for developing country or emerging countries, to be how you think about design the infrastructure. This is, this is the cyber first I mentioned by IT for the 2B environment Think about assuming you have sophisticated a good digital technology. So this is the uh, one of the example. This is the uh, logistics in about 200 years ago. It was exclusive logistics system every single industry, every single company has. That is the exclusive use, exclusive build, the infrastructure. What the very good invention by the human being was container and pirate. This went to sharing economy in physical package transportation, right? When you have a container or a pirate, every single you know, material be able to put into the same package. The package be able to transfer by air to air airplane, train, ship, or car, whatever you have, which is a completely perfect sharing economy for existing material or merchandise as well as future materials. One of the examples using this particular infrastructure was Amazon, right? So this is the before the internet. What the internet did was exactly the same thing as container and pirate. Digital information is going to be transferred for everywhere on any technology like a Wi-Fi, you know, glass fibers or copper fibers, and also any material digitized thing is going to be able to transfer everywhere on the earth, like a text, video, or voice, whatever, whatever you have, or program as well, or recipe for the 3D, 3D printer as well. One of the other thing 
I want to, sh I want to share is the, uh, the cost or carbon footprint regarding the physical object transformation versus digital object transformation. The huge cost is going to be different. Huge energy productivity improvement can be done, replace the physical transportation to digital transportation going to be done. This is actual number, material, electricity versus digital bits. Two order of magnitude. This is real number I discussed with a power company in Japan. How the difference cost and operational cost, the investments cost install and operation and replacement, then digital bit going to be 100 once compared to electricity. The electricity versus material, yet another two, you know, two order magnitude difference. All right? This is very interesting. So this is the reason why I put in those slides is we want to show the demonstration, what we can do at the concrete number, concrete figures. Thank you. Thank you very much, <coughs> Isaac Sensei. Um, we have now arrived at our interactive session. So this is a golden opportunity uh, for all attendees to pose questions, share thoughts, or discuss any the topics we've touched upon today. Um, so does anyone who have any questions here? <laughs> Maybe at first, no. So um, I think Cory, so um, are, you, are you there? Um, maybe uh, you wanted to introduce one video, right? Um, certainly. So, could, so could, yeah, <coughs> could you introduce well, one, one, you know, uh, shortly about the video, and I will ask to, uh, you know, the IT operator to, to, you know, start the video. So, um. absolutely. So this um, video represents a um, program that I had worked on uh, with Berkeley University, um, with India, and with the U.S. government, looking at the transformation of cities. Um, in the use of the technologies of the areas that we've discussed. So the way to view this video is a program that was ran for seven years and went across three countries. And it's sharing some of the lessons and some of the activities um, that took place. If okay. you would like to run the video, that would be great. Yeah, okay. So, so start, sorry, I'm going to the video. India is poised to become the fifth largest economy in the world. As more buildings are added at a healthy rate of 8% every year, building energy use is skyrocketing. Trends in the Indian construction, especially the new construction, the urban heat increase, and the high occupancy levels in India present unique challenges to the building ecosystem. India enjoys many advantages, including a strong tradition of passively cool buildings, a wide occupant tolerance to heat, a ready supply of local sustainable construction materials, inexpensive labor and craft costs, and careful use of resources. At Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, we are committed to working with Indian research community, industry, and government to develop building technologies that enhance building comfort, push the envelope for efficiency, and improve the health, safety, and life of building occupants in both countries. The United States and India have been collaborating on a U.S.-India Joint Center for Building Energy Research and Development called Seabird. Seabird is a dynamic public-private partnership that involves academic research institutions and partners in both countries that do collaborative research to bring new energy efficiency technology to both U.S. and India. In Seabird, we deploy what we call a three by three model. The first three is make sure that we advance government policies, industrial practice, and research findings about energy efficient buildings. And the second three is making sure that we understand how to design them right, how to build them right, and how to operate them right. Only when this happens, we are able to implement on a wide scale throughout the economy energy-efficient buildings with technologies that are highly cost-effective. 
and are able to reduce energy consumption per square foot by about a factor of five below what is the norm. Through the collaborative research between US researchers and Indian researchers, over the last five years of Seabird, we have developed nine new technologies, 40 significant exchanges between Indian scientists and US scientists, more than 100 peer-reviewed publications, four patent disclosures, and we have more than 10 demonstrations. One of the guiding principles of doing that was to bring together information technology and physical systems. US has had a long lead for building world-class physical systems, facades, HVAC systems, high-efficiency chillers, and so on. India has a fantastic depth in technical prowess in information technology. Our goal was to bring them together in a way that benefits both countries, and both each country gets more than what they put in. Working shoulder to shoulder on common problems, developing joint publications, joint technologies, having joint demonstration projects has led to such a deep mutual respect and understanding that I couldn't have imagined we would, have be, we would be ending at this point. The expertise that the US scientists brought in in this Indo-US collaborative project on building energy efficiency was very helpful. It helped in accelerating the research, developing products and processes which can be deployed and make a real difference in the building sector in India. Another way we collaborate between the US and India is by developing tools and resources for the public that are available on our websites, as well as new facilities like this game-changing facility called FlexLab. FlexLab is the world's most advanced testbed for energy efficient technologies. FlexLab is also a testing system to allow us to integrate the systems with the electric grid, with batteries and photovoltaic systems. I want to mention the new best practices guide that is a tool for how to design energy efficient buildings. And it has a lot of information on designing the facade, the HVAC systems, and other components for low energy buildings. These best practices are particularly suited to the cultural, climatic, and construction context of India. The guide is based on three core principles. One, using a triple bottom line framework for energy efficiency decision making using financial capital, environmental capital, and enhanced working environments as a theme. Two, aggressive but achievable energy performance targets. And three, creating a shared set of values across all stakeholders from building owners, developers, builders, architects, engineers, and policymakers. The strategic insight into design, the idea of integrating the building with its electromechanical systems in conceptualizing solutions is a real lesson here. It is the technical depth, the analytical framework, and the advice that is given, where as, as the guide goes across various climatic zones and look at, looks at different technical solutions, is extremely helpful indeed. I think it's a great piece of work. I feel like India's being propelled into a digital and decarbonized future and buildings are a prime opportunity to actually use this advantage and really make and shape the future. So Corey, thank you for introducing the video. And uh, as Esaki Sensei mentioned, you know, India and US and Japan, USA and Japan, it's not advanced uh, relating to, you know, using the renewable energy, right? So I think we have much space to, to you know, uh, increasing this kind of the field. And uh, so Corey, I, I want to ask you, so based on your experience in digital transformation landscape, what do you believe are the primary obstacles that are not only the universities, but you know, today we discussed about the green, you know, building, you know, policy in universities, but you know, not only the university, but more like business field. So what is the obstacle uh, of this, you know, uh, field? Do you have any thought or, you know? 
Sure. I, I would say ex experiences has taught us that, that the vision um, really has to be led, I think, with a portion of the city. Hmm. So just as you're talking about the University of Tokyo team with Microsoft, that is a great place to start. It, you know, you can define what is, what is a smart space or a smart city. Um, and so an obstacle would be, although you have to have very large ambitions, you need to choose a section, right? That is doable and you need to um, start fast actually. And many of these technologies, these digital twins and these ideas of IOT devices, they exist. Right. So I would start with tried and true technologies. If you think too far out that only technologies you can depend on five years, 10 years from now being discovered, you're not going to move very fast. Mm. You should start with known technology, do something that's sizable, but also look at scale and be responsible R&D. And I think the, the biggest obstacle is ultimately aligning the visionary leadership to the actual implementers. Right. It goes back to that democratization and getting people on the ground to, to do this. Ideas of digital tins and, and visualization is a huge way of overcoming this mm -hmm. and really having success. Great, thank you. So I think you know you are developing the uh, green building uh, model policy in the G20 Global Smart Alliance, right? So if if you know uh, possible, you know, could you introduce some point about the you know you are developing the the policy? Certainly. So one of the uh, programs that we are uh, leading is looking at what we call the um, Green um, Sustainability City Alliance right now. Mm -hmm. And it's about taking policies that, of course, would make sense for cities, but there's a lot out there, right? Many organizations doing things. So what we looked at was saying, let's look at existing policies and start with um, areas that would have the most impact and build upon others' work already versus reinventing or going in a different direction. So our first policy is actually embodied carbon. Mm -hmm. And we said embodied carbon for existing buildings. We're going to do new buildings eventually, but we take existing structures first. And then the second part that we're going to be looking at for policy is actually procurement. So the idea of sustainable procurement, how do you choose the right materials? How do you get to the right economics coming across there? And then the third area we're still exploring, it takes about six to eight months to do a policy. We're just finishing the embodied carbon one and we're starting the sustainable procurement. We'll likely be zoning. And zoning is so important, but it's a very complex government issue, locality issue. And I would say the lesson that we've learned over and over again that we hear from everybody, it's about contextualization or localization. You can take a great policy that works in London or that works in Tokyo and does that translate to Kyoto, or does that translate to another city? You probably have to do something upstream or downstream in order for that policy to, to make sense, right? And I would say the other one is that when you ask other policy leaders who are working on these programs, they're very open to discussing and to sharing their networks. And that's another very powerful thing. And I think often policy groups try to work in their own silos and they don't reach out enough. And when they do, you can quickly accelerate what's what's taking place. So that's really what we're looking at right now. Great. So thank you. So um, what what role do you see for global IT companies uh, shaping the future of smart campuses or smart buildings? Or I mean, you know. So now. So yeah. they're going to play. Oh, sorry. Um, they they play a very key role because ultimately. These systems have to live in a digital backbone, right? They, they have to be digitalized for this to work. So that's the hyperscalers. This is the Microsofts, right? This is the, the, these tool sets that come across there. So IT Global, um, even as we talk about whether it's generative AI or other you know, areas that are more traditional about running systems, think of this. All buildings already run off of systems. You know, we already have systems that look at our economics, that look at our energy, that look at our mobility. However, as we look at sustainability and we look for these efficiencies that Dr. Esagai was, 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 um, Zaki was talking about, we have to build things upstream and downstream connectors mm -hmm. to, those, to those backbones. When you talked about BMW, unless it works in their centralized system, they're, they're building attachments. They're not rebuilding things from scratch. And that's what's important for this consistency 
because it's this specialized factory approach combined with academic R&D leadership, I think is really what does very well. And I will say that the winning formula that I see right now is what I'm seeing taking place at this point at this table. And what it means is this, if you can take a university academic led project and look at something like an airport or a controlled part of the city, and you can get a major IT global service provider with that and with the policymakers, you have the, the chance to have that winning formula. Thank you very much, yeah. So um, back to the Tokyo University's cases. So as Exxon said, so um, I think you, know, you, you already like you know, realized you know, 30, more than 30 percent decreasing of the you know energy consumption, right? So um, what is the key point? You know, I, I think you have more you know, like uh, key kind of the issue to implementing such kind of you know um, decarbonized you know decision. So um, do you have any thoughts? About it? Well, simple thing is the uh, we are we love technology, um, we love Earth, and we are globe. So uh, you know, and also. We really love the students. Yeah. They're working together. You know, and also they are, they, they are future power to change the world. So uh, that, uh, that's an important thing when we have a collaboration with industry and academia. In the case of academia, not only the senior professors, they don't have any power anymore, right? The younger people have a lot of powers and experience to, to the future. So uh, I, when, I, when I talk with a colleague, he initiated, you know, leading universities collaboration about the you know such a technological hackathon or demonstrations. In, in his slide, there is a demonstration is quite important. Like how we show the fact or knowledge, experience, sharing those things is quite important, not only by document, by real experience, but touching to the uh, computer system in the uh, living building or campus, that is quite important. So that is the we share with the Microsoft when we went to the Red Barn uh, headquarter office. We really share engineers or executives should touch on real system then realize what's going on. Then think about the real solution or concrete solution, not the politician mm. we are. That, that's the colleague firstly mentioned, the mistake of the smart city at this point of time is government initiated, not the multi-stakeholder action. They didn't. So we must have multi-stakeholder, you know, agile approach with the academia and industry, with supporting by government. That is an important model. We want to share based on the uh, practical experience. That is the IGF should do. The other thing is the uh, you know, democratiz democratization. That is yet another point that Corey mentioned about. Not control by the single large company, nor large government. The data itself owned by users, right? So how to protect those privacy or intellectual property? Then though we must have the kind, kind of collaboration in the case of the you know, public uh, sectors, infrastructures, or private sectors. So that kind of, you know, very careful, very healthy, multi-stakeholder discussion about how manage the data privacy or data usage is yet another thing. Important thing is that is not determined by government. It must be determined by multi-stakeholder discussion. So, do you want to introduce? Okay, yeah. So thank you, Ezek Sensei. Um, then uh, move on to the. I, I'd like to ask to Ishiyama san about. Uh, so this is actually so uh, when I heard the you know Microsoft you know Azure Digital Twin. Um, I'm very interesting because, you know, using the IT software, you know, so this means, you know, we use the electricity, but we can reduce the electricity, right? So this is kind of the complicated, but, you know, this is very interesting. So um, as Esak Sensei mentioned, but, you know, like uh, the Microsoft is definitely the giant. And 
if you provide such kind of the software to the each buildings, maybe many building owners or you know some developers or they are kind of you know worry about that, right? So um, as a technology governance issue, so what what is obstacle or is your your business field or if you have any thoughts or you know uh, things, let me could you share this? Yeah, uh, thanks for your questions. Uh, well, the, as uh, Yuta san said. Uh, governance of the IT and uh, also data is uh, really important. So we see the uh, not only the uh, general IT, but also now the generative AI is the, uh, very uh, like uh, appearing uh, very rapidly. So uh, the, as I said, the ownership of the data and uh, uh, control of the data uh, is really uh, important. Even uh, more important uh, than ever. So, uh, so as Isaac, uh, Dr. Esaki said, the multi-stakeholder multi uh, decision making is really important. So, uh, to to do that, the it's uh, so we think about the the how I can say, we think about the, the ownership of the uh, data. So that that could be the obstacle. So. As Microsoft said, uh, Microsoft Microsoft said that uh, data ownership is the customer, uh, but uh, we need to uh, multi stakeholder uh, need to recognize uh, that to uh, move forward very smoothly. Mm. Yeah, I guess. Thank you very much. But uh, Corey mentioned, like you know, so the, as a G Global Smart Alliance, we are developing the G kind of green building you know, model policies. But I think, you know, for many companies, if we have such kind of the guideline or, you know, model policy, I think it's very easy to discuss, discuss for, I mean, you know, uh, what is the standard? And, you know, if we know that this is very, you know, uh, easy to implement such kind of the thing. So I think, you know, we really needed to implement such kind of the policy to the market. Yeah. Thank you very much. So still we have uh, three, four minutes. So when, if the, you know, participants have any question, I'd like to ask to the speaker, but do you have, no? Oh, yeah, online is also. Okay, I can't see any questions. So maybe, you know, after the session, if you want to communicate with each speaker. Oh, okay, could you, could you please? Uh, Tyrell mentioned, I think it should be science, te technology, engineering, and medicine. STEM, that's an education thing. Mm. Also, please feel free to add any question. Okay. Uh, this is, this is, uh, yeah. okay. okay, so could you uh, back to the slide, sorry. Um, so I just want to mention some points. So, um, uh, So um, I know, you know, in this venue, you know, there are so many experts here. And definitely, you know, what we discussed today, uh, we are lack of the expert. And if you want to join the G20 Global Smart Alliance Network, uh, let me know that. So there are so many, you know, experts, uh, policy maker, academia, and private sector, you know, experts uh, joining our, you know, uh, project, and they are, you know, discussing about what the, uh, you know, policy uh, should be implemented to the city, and you know, we are always welcome. So uh, let me know if you want to join this. And as a conclusion, um, so thank you very much for participating today. Uh, what an enlightening session we have with the HUD. Uh, from understanding the smart campus uh, blueprint to discussing cutting edge technologies role, uh, it's clear that the future of education infrastructure is on a promising path. A special thank you to our esteemed speakers for sharing their knowledge and to all attendees for their active participation. Uh, let's, we don't have any questions. So. <laughs> let's carry forward these learnings and insight to make our campus smarter and our world a better place. Uh, thank you and see you in the next session of IGF.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.